happening that year in Hong Kong. And uh, so I still took the course because we were all required to take the course, uh, but I took it from Mac as he was known to the students, Myers McDougall. And throughout the year displayed considerable skepticism about the last will McDougall approach. At the end of the course, McDougall, a prodigious and extraordinarily courtly Mississippian, called me to his office. Anybody from Mississippi here? No? We have to do something about that. Um, uh, 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 this Mississippian called me to his office and said something to the effect that he understood that I disagreed with him a lot but that he thought well of me and if I wanted a teaching position in the United States he would help to find me one. During that year, 1961-62, I also got to know what in Ger with the German expression was known as Das Dorf, the village in New York City. A group of mostly German Jewish refugees my high school teacher, Anna Stahl, had provided a contact to a refugee from the Nazis, Charlotte Berat, who had been a journalist in Berlin during the Weimar years. Berat, on her part, was a close friend of Hannah Arendt, the famous philosopher, and thus I became friends to Charlotte Berat and Hannah Arendt, and later at the University of Chicago, Hannah and I actually taught a seminar together uh, at the height of the Vietnam War on the Nuremberg trials. These friendships mattered greatly in my education. Uh, when I encountered the, these two women, when I encountered them, they were about 30 years older than I was. And uh, I want to encourage all of you to remember, though you are with your age cohort and you are part of a peer group and so on, don't get just consumed by the youth culture. There are other people in life who are older and therefore implausibly adding anything to what you might want to have, but uh, and it, in the end it can pay off very, very importantly and very uh, nicely. Um, uh, I wanted to say a, a, a word about one of these two women, Charlotte Berat. As I said, she had been a journalist in Berlin and then had to flee. She, uh, just at the time I got to know her, published her first book and it was called The Third Reich of Dreams. What Charlotte Berat had done was, in, she fled Germany in 1938. In the years between 1933 and 1938, she asked everybody among her acquaintances, everybody, uh, uh, for any dreams that had a political, manifest political content. And she put them down on paper. And uh, so you have this incredibly f f shocking, disturbing collection of dreams that teaches one thing, this is a period from 1933 to 1938, uh, 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 that many of the uh, victims, the later victims of Hitler, understood in their dreams much better than would, what they would, than they admitted in daily life, uh, what the dangers were. The book uh, I saw to it that it was published in an English translation also, and uh, unfortunately it is not presently in print, but you can easily locate it, of course, in in the library or on the web. Uh, the Third Reich of Dreams. Uh, you might want to take a look. Now, I told you about MacDougall, and due essentially to him, my first academic position was as an assistant professor of political science at Berkeley in 1964. I admit that reluctantly, and when I talk, talk to Stanford alumni, they usually boo. Uh, at this point, and you are very civilized, you haven't done that yet. Uh, uh, my hunch is, uh, in a few years, you might do that too. Now, I had been recruited to teach comparative law and legal theory, 
And within two weeks of my arrival in Berkeley in 1964, the French Revolution broke out, the so-called free speech movement. And uh, I could now report to you about the free speech movement and uh, what it did to students and faculty uh, for hours, but I won't. Uh, uh, there's no way I would want to miss the next two years from my life, but in, uh, when in my second year at Berkeley I received an offer from the University of Chicago Law School, I decided to go to Chicago where I happily spent the next 26 years. And uh, after my first year at uh, Chicago, I picked up on multidisciplinarity again by accepting a joint appointment with the Chicago Political uh, Science uh, Department. Uh, one reason, there were obviously professional reasons that made me go back to a law school, uh, but among the reasons was also the fact uh, that uh, Berkeley was not in those years, Berkeley is a fantastically good university, uh, but in those years it was not academically very attractive because it was consumed by the politics of uh, the free uh, speech movement and uh, uh, I spent a lot of my time as a young ac academic and assistant professor trying uh, uh, to help out and solve uh, some of the issues that preoccupied occupied the university. So after my high school, the universities of Freiburg and Yale, the University of Chicago was my fourth great academic experience. The law school faculty was relatively small, between 30 and 40 faculty members. It was a very intense place where everybody criticized everybody else. Uh, the notion, of, uh, the Chicago notion at that time, I don't know how it is now, but the, at that time the Chicago notion of a supportive environment for young faculty or students for that matter was that when you had drafted an article you were expected to circulate it among your colleagues all your colleagues, including those who had nothing to do with constitutional law. And uh, you were expected to uh, circulate it, and then a few days later it would come back with comments in the margin. Nonsense, Gerhard, how can you possibly say something like that, and so on. <laughs> this was the, the, the Chicago version of a supportive environment. Instead of being kind and gentle, uh, uh, they were sometimes almost brutal, uh, though that it was not meant that way. The law school had a deep influence on my scholarly life. I had been recruited to do comparative law and legal theory, but one day, my first year, my colleague Phil Cur Philip Curland, then one of the great figures in American constitutional law, advised me to take up one of the major subjects in American law. Uh, he said to me, Gerhard, you will never be taken serious. <laughs> this was part of the support environment. You will never be taken seriously here if you stay with comparative law and legal theory because most of your colleagues wouldn't have any idea what you do there. And uh, so I went straight to the dean's office uh, and said to the dean that I wanted to teach uh, constitutional law. And he gave me that chance, and this was in 1966. And from then on, I taught all the different fields within constitutional law and developed courses in United States constitutional history. Now, I was going to tell you a little bit about uh, my scholarship and what I was most interested in, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. And um, I uh, point out, however, that something happened at the law school of the University of Chicago that distinctly put me on the road that ended up at Stanford. It is part of the many unintended consequences uh, we encounter in life. The law school at Chicago decided it needed a new dean. Law school deans get uh, usually 
elected or selected at least by their faculty and uh, they take these positions not just for a couple of years but for longer periods. And the faculty at Chicago thought they were two internal candidates. I uh, believed the other one should become dean and the other one thought I should be the dean and I lost. <laughs> Thus came my first introduction to the task of somebody is protesting, um, if in a subdued way, it might be gone, right? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, it was my first introduction to the task of assuring quality of faculty and students, curriculum and infrastructure, of maintaining relations with the rest of the university, very important, uh, with alumni and other outside constituencies. The task of fundraising, of being a public figure in American legal education. Yes, I do. Ah. Ha! You think I will get it back? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an iPhone 7. <laughs> Sorry, I, if there are any Samsung adherents here, still uh, I, I didn't want to uh, do, run a commercial for, for iPhone. Um, so I did this job as dean for nine years. And as I acquired some kind of a reputation, I was approached for university presidencies, but stayed away from them completely. After stepping down as dean in 1987, I had a sabbatical and then returned to the faculty. And in 1989, the then president of the University of Chicago, Hannah Gray, asked me to become provost. The decision to accept that offer was in hindsight, it, though not then, it, only in hindsight, a gigantic step in the direction of ending up at Stanford, though that was clearly not part of anybody's plan. And that is again something you want to keep in mind. You have your plans, your immediate plans, your five-year plans and so on, and then things happen that you cannot possibly predict. Uh, like almost everybody who had the job of provost at a good American university, I loved it. I loved especially the multidisciplinary challenges and I loved having responsibility for teaching, learning and research university-wide, for attempting to figure out what needs to change, what needs to be preserved and perhaps most important, what must not be done. My great good fortune in life has been that in the United States I have been associated with four different manifestations of higher education at its best. Yale, Berkeley, Chicago and Stanford. Now how did I end up at Stanford? There is more there than meets the eye and I, I shall in conclusion tell you the story as it unfolded. In, in 1990, 91 1990-91, Harvard conducted a search for the successor to Derek Bach, a person who had been president of Harvard for many years. <laughs> to my great surprise, I was considered a serious contender. Indeed, as it turned out, I was a runner-up to Neil Rudenstein, who was appointed Harvard president in March of 1991. In July of 1991, Don Kennedy, the president of Stanford, uh, announced his resignation as of September 1, 1992. Given the publicity surrounding the Harvard search, I had to assume that I would be on a Stanford list. <coughs> However, I must confess that in light of the then considerable problems at Stanford, from a conf major controversy with the federal government over indirect costs, 
to substantial financial deficits, to faculty morale, to the fights over the humanities requirement, to the earthquake damage, Stanford was not foremost on my mind. If I wanted a university president, presidency, most everybody in Chicago, including Hannah Gray, assumed that I would be her successor. But again, I want you to understand something, and this is uh, uh, very important as you think about your lives later as it develops. I did not seek a university president. I had never the career goal of becoming a university president. I didn't have the career goal of becoming a dean of the law school or a provost. I did it because my colleagues approached me and asked, would I do it? And uh, it, it was not something that I thought uh, should be pursued even as uh, a, a career. And so to some extent, as I really recognized for the first time when I gave that talk in Weimar, to which I referred earlier, uh, I, my career is, is shaped by what other people thought I should be doing or was good at it. And to some extent, to use the sociological jargon of an earlier age, I was other directed and not just inner directed. It was a mix of things. Now, the Stanford trustees were bent on avoiding the speculations and leaks that had characterized the 1990-91 Harvard search. And Stanford conducted its search in complete confidentiality then and most recently uh, last uh, this year. Uh, I never applied for the job, nor did I hear from Stanford or talk to them until February 7, 1992, when four members of the search committee, Jim Sheehan, a historian from Stanford, now retired, its deputy chair, a wonderful man, uh, the then trustee George Hume, Condi Rice, and Jim Larrimore, an assistant dean, visited me at our apartment in Hyde Park, to uh, uh, the part of Chicago where I lived. Uh, my apartment in Hyde Park to discuss to my views of Stanford and possible candidates for the Stanford presidency. That is the usual trick that is used under these circumstances. You don't go to somebody and ask, might you possibly be interested in becoming president of Harvard or Stanford or Yale or whatever, uh, uh, but uh, you ask them, what are your views about the presidency? And tell us, do you know any people who you think are highly qualified to become president? And so this happens in early February of 1992, and there was no further contact until March 5, when the chairman of the search committee, trustee John Lilly, then board member of the board, and the then board chairman, a man by the name of Jim Gaither, came to Chicago to ask me to meet with the entire search committee. Now you have to understand, so these two people walk into my apartment, I open the door, they walk into the apartment and say, would you be willing to meet with the entire search committee? That was literally the opening line. <laughs> and I, hey, I said, sit down, have a cup of coffee, and let's talk a little bit about Stanford and how you, what you think about Stanford's problems and so on. And then at the end of a two-hour conversation, uh, Jim Gaither repeated the question of whether I would be willing to meet with the search committee. And I said, okay, I pulled out my calendar and leafed through and said, well, like three weeks from now looks good. And Gaither said, no, no, in three days. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I agreed, but I made it a condition. I said, I would not come to Stanford. It, the meeting had to be somewhere else because I did not want to be recognized uh, 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 here at Stanford by faculty, who would then immediately report back to the Chicago faculty. And uh, uh, so we actually me met uh, in uh, uh, an office suite in Los Angeles 
uh, uh, that had, was owned and had been furnished overnight by Peter Bing. You know Bing Concert Hall. Peter Bing is a long standing, an alumnus, a long standing trustee, a great supporter of Stanford. And uh, he was then on the board. And he overnight furnished this uh, office suite in which we uh, met and uh, in, in Century City. And uh, one week later, the Stanford Board of Trustees voted to offer me the Stanford presidency, and I accepted on March 17, St. Patrick's Day, particularly celebrated usually in Chicago. Uh, now I want to say something about, since I know there was a, a, a lot of unhappiness here at Stanford last spring because of the way the search committee had proceeded. And this is now whether for better or worse, you, some people may believe my coming to Stanford was a terrible thing. But I want to say, but for the confidentiality of the Stanford search, I would never have ended up at Stanford. Never. Had the matter leaked, or had there been extensive speculation about it, which there just wasn't, I am convinced that pressures would have been brought to bear in Chicago that would have made me stay in the Midwest. And I liked Chicago, I, I loved the university, it was the obvious. On the other hand, after meeting with the Stanford Search Committee in Los Angeles, I considered the Stanford possibility in ways in which I had not done previously. The quality of the Search Committee uh, made up um, usually of kind of half trustees and half faculty and some staff and, and student representation. Their quality, commitment, <coughs> seriousness, and enthusiasm painted a picture of the challenges at the university that made me see Stanford as an extraordinary opportunity. And so I came in the fall of 1992, and here I still am, and this is how I ended up at Stanford. Okay. <laughs> Question? Yeah, sure. Do you want to field the yeah, sure. So, uh, uh, we, uh, when I taught in Bishop uh, last time, which was first quarter freshman, I warned uh, the students always uh, that uh, uh, I was a law professor and law professors call on students. And I indeed had arranged for a box. Uh, uh, with name cards for every student uh, in the room. And at the beginning, I would uh, uh, pick a card from the box and would say who admits to being Smith or whatever, and uh, then call on Smith and engage her in a lengthy uh, uh, discussion. Uh, I called this box the box of opportunity, and the students called it the box of terror. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I, I will call on you if you don't volunteer. Oh. <laughs> Usually, I call on people in the last row, as you know. Uh, uh, yeah, good. Uh, what's your favorite part of Chicago? I'm sorry? What's your favorite part of Chicago? Well, as I said, I lived in, in uh, Hyde Park, which is where the university is, and uh, I, I liked it very much. Uh, 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 it uh, uh, was, the, at that point, perhaps the only integrated neighborhood in the entire, in any big city in the United States. It was kind of uh, part of the south side, but Hyde Park itself, uh, the uh, south side was mostly black. Hyde Park itself was uh, integrated. And uh, I, uh, I loved the experience. Uh, when you ask me kind of in the abstract, uh, what is my favorite uh, part? I, I, I am presently serving on a board in Chicago of, of a foundation and uh, downtown Chicago is 
a wonderful experience. Uh, uh, you know, as are you from Chicago? Yes. Yeah. Uh, as uh, uh, I, I lived there, as I said, for 26 years, and the downtown improved every year of those 26 years, and still does. However, of course, the west side did not improve, and the south side imp has some improved a little bit. Uh, I mean, Chicago has these incredible tensions and problems, but in terms of architecture, in particular, particular contemporary architecture, Chicago was for me a very important lesson, and it too had an impact on Stanford. Uh, so when I came in 1992, I was introduced to all the leading university officials, including the, the then university architect. And uh, I asked him, well, how do you pick architects for Stanford projects? And he said, well, we have a project, we look at a list of possible candidates, and then ask somebody whether he's interested. And I asked, and what role does the president play in the picking of architects? None, 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 none whatsoever. <laughs> uh, so I said, OK. <laughs> Two things will change. <laughs> From now on, we will do a design competition on every major project uh, we are contemplating. Architect, well, that's uh, another. Uh, a design competition, and secondly, I will preside over the design competition. <laughs> so uh, you can see my handiwork all over from, from that point of view, all over campus. But why did I do this? I was just used to extremely high standards in contemporary architecture from Chicago. Yeah. Um, now, now that you talked about your presidency at Stanford, what do you look forward to in the future in terms of education in your career? Uh, for, for myself? Yes. Well, uh, so, uh, you know, serendipity, so uh, um, I, uh, I, for the first time, uh, uh, really for the first time in any real sense, uh, last year went back to Germany, though in an American disguise. I, uh, uh, I think I mentioned it, I was president of the American Academy in Berlin, which is a center for advanced study. And um, uh, that was uh, an interesting experience. First of all, Berlin is a fantastically lively place. If you can travel and if you uh, are open to suggestions, Berlin is kind of the withered place these days in Europe. And in particular, lots of young people go there. And there is 